Thanks for the nice words. <laughs> uh, I'm super happy to be here and showing you what we did uh, in this Dexter world and what's our journey uh, to getting to Dexter and migrating uh, to Dexter at Prezi. So let's start how we started. I think the like the data is data engineering and the data team started uh, around like eight years ago at Prezi. We started like I think like most of the companies where we have a bunch of shell script and scheduled with cron. Of course, at some point, as uh, the ETI job started to grow, we basically uh, we figured out that it won't scale. So we, we had to come up with some kind of solution uh, on that. It was like six years ago. We were looking around on the open source world, what other tools there are, what we can use. And to be honest, we couldn't find a, a, a uh, orchest orchestration uh, which would work for us so that's why we decided okay let's build our own one uh, we call this flow keeper that's what you can see on on the screen this uh, this is our homegrown uh, or orchestration there. and one of the main design decision why we decided to create a new one and not going some existing one uh, is simplicity. So one of the requirements from our users was basically to not, uh, they basically, uh, they don't, did not want it to write a uh, code to have a pipeline. And that's why we come up with a, with a new uh, orchestrator where we had a JSON based config. Uh, if you wanted to create a ETI job or uh, for our orchestrator, the only thing you have to do is basically creating a JSON file and that's it and i will show you how it looked like <clears throat> basically this is the this is a pretty simple uh json descriptor what you can see here where you can basically define the scheduling type you have two types is daily and hourly schedule you can define the inputs what your uh, job is using and also you can as you can see there you can give some kind of friendly name and there is a pass what you can define. In this case, this is an S3 pass, uh, what we pass. And, uh, and also you could define what kind of data sets your job will generate. So in this case, this job uh, input is some kind of S3 location or, uh, and then it will produce some kind of uh, redshift table. And when, uh, and, you should know that. So these input and outputs is, is really you. We use this to build up the whole dependency graph in our orchestration. And we did we 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 did not go with that concept. But you can see somewhere else or like a like other orchestrator where you can just basically uh, define your job names. And that's the way how you define dependencies between two jobs. Here we basically went in the past that that you only have to know what kind of data set you want to work with. And based on that, we will figure out uh, the dependencies and which job it needs to be connected. So basically, if you define, uh, if you said that uh, your input is this S3 location, what you can see here, and uh, we saw that the other jobs generated the same S3 location, we connected the two jobs. Basically, this, this, this was or how we set up the dependencies between jo these jobs. I think it's pretty simple and it's, it's, it's worked for us because usually the user knows what they are working on a bit, uh, what kind of data sets, but they are not really aware of uh, which job generates that. And we defined a couple of uh, predefined job types. These are what you could use. And the, uh, here in this example is a redshift load. Basically what it does, you, you specify input and we load the input data into redshift with the, proper, with the parameters, what you can see down there. And uh, we have uh, a few job times like redshift load, redshift line transform, which was basically running a SQL script. And we have Spark jobs and, and like Python jobs and a few others. And we also defined uh, the, the, the uh, tiers. So every data set put in some kind of tier, which basically uh, is the priority. What does it mean? Uh, you can imagine that you have a bunch of data set, especially if you have like hundreds of data sets, uh, then it can happen then, uh, and hundreds of ETI jobs, then it can happen that 
that you have two jobs and the uh, and, uh, two jobs can run at the same time. Uh, but uh, like on the resource, what you want to run, there you can allow like running two uh, in parallel. In that case, you have to make sure uh, the more important uh, data set will be ready earlier. And this is what uh, tiers means here. The lower the tier, the jobs uh, get, uh, will be scheduled earlier if possible. And another thing what I failed to mention, it's basically the job type. And, and the job type, this is a redshift node. And the job type also uh, define the resource, uh, what we are going to use. So in this case, uh, redshift, and even in our homegrown uh, scheduler, we had these uh, uh, queue, uh, resource queues, where basically we made sure that you can't overload uh, the resources, uh, what the jobs is using. You can imagine, I guess, if you have like hundreds of jobs which can run in parallel, but if you would run these hundreds of jobs, heavy jobs uh, in, on Redshift, that you most probably would kill that. So this was the state, uh, this, this was our own scheduler, what we built, and we built some nice user-friendly UI, which is a pretty simple grid, uh, where you can see the jobs uh, which uh, uh, was finished and what the state is, and if something fails, you can see there as well. Uh, so think, things are looking good, and it seems like a user really liked it, and we ended up with a, a dependency graph like this. So we had around 900 jobs, and if you have 900 jobs, then you will face with a few issues. And that's why we were really thinking uh, if we want to fix those in our current homegrown orchestrator, or we are looking for uh, some open source alternatives. And why we decided to not uh, improving our homegrown uh, orchestrator. Basically, one thing is the maintenance overhead. So the data engineering team is a handful of people at, at Prezi. So we did not really have the capacity to fully focus on uh, working on the orchestrator. Another, the, another thing is what you saw uh, before this grid. So you can only see the actual job which fails, but you can't really see the dependencies between the jobs. So if, if uh, you can't really see from that, if a job fails, then what other jobs were affected as well uh, due to that, that failure? Another thing is uh, these orchestrators currently running uh, on uh, one EC2 machine, and uh, which if ties, then uh, we are in the trouble, then we had to, uh, start a new machine and setting up everything there. And also there are problems that because we are running all of our jobs in one machine, it can happen that two jobs interfere with each other. You can imagine if one job basically uh, generates too high CPU load or just eat up the disk space or uh, even worse when, when basically you have some with the users and they just uh, start expecting that they can write to a, a temporary folder and one job without uh, defining the, as a dependency between each other. One just put down some file there and the other one expects to pick it up. And of course, the infrastructure at present is moving to Kubernetes, so uh, our data infrastructure uh, needed to move as well to Kubernetes. Now another thing was basically, uh, basically we, we wrote it like six years ago and we had less uh, really, uh, Few, uh, uh, not much time to work on that fully. It was really written in a, in a not very extendable way. So it was hard to add new job types and etc. And the last one is with the lack of testing. Uh, we really missed that. So it's one, uh, so if our users wanted to uh, test our jobs. Mostly they had to log into one machine, copying their, their file and trying it out from that specific uh, uh, machine. And we, want to, we wanted to provide a way better user experience to them. Uh, and basically that was the time when, uh, uh, when we talked with the Dexter team and they convinced us that let's try out their tool and uh, try to and, and let's see if it, how it works for us. And that's when we decided, okay, let's try to migrate to this new system. But of course, if you want to migrate to a new system, you don't want to write all of your ETI jobs from scratch. So uh, what, what was 
our first requirement when we try to move to Dexter is basically to being able to keep our descriptors and uh, migrating and, and using it uh, for generating uh, solids in Dexter. So basically what we wanted, we had a car and we wanted to replace the engine, a way better engine and a way more reliable engine. And this is what we did. Uh, so keeping our uh, job descriptors. Uh, first of all, we used the uh, job descriptor and started to generate solids from it. How this looks like. First of all, uh, we generated a solid config, which I now saw uh, that it should be a config schema, uh, which basically if you treat solid as a function which has parameters, then config, is be, uh, uh, config uh, are the parameters and its types. And uh, as you can see here, uh, we had the original uh, JSON descriptor, what you can see down there, it's a redshift transform and we generated a nice uh, schema, a config schema for that. What you can see on the right side, uh, this screenshot from uh, Dexter. So as you can see, the type can be there or, and, and for every uh, descriptor, we generate one specific solid for it. So that's why it's uh, uh, so rigid. So here you can change uh, Redshift transform any other types because their inputs and even the processing wouldn't make sense. So there, as you can see, you can only specify Redshift transform and you can, uh, and there are all the parameters which can be used uh, in the Redshift transform. So in this case, uh, the, uh, like the SQL file, which basically says which SQL file needs to be run on Redshift when you're running this job. Of course, now, so now you have a function and you have all the parameters. So you have a solid and, or, or, and, and the config schemas, but you need all the parameters or the values that you want to pass that. And this is, this, uh, these are the presets. Uh, we also generating the preset YAML from our JSON descriptor. Like if you, Check here on the right side. This is this one is generated one. The left side is basically one which is in our JSON. And as you can see there, uh, we generated a nice uh, preset uh, where we say that uh, where we uh, prefill all the values. What uh, what are uh, what are in uh, in the JSON descriptor? And later on, if you want, of course, on the playground. You can you can change it if you want to run some test run, but but basically you don't have to do anything. We do it. We prefill it for you. Like in this example, you can see that uh, the, this Redshift transform is prefilled with the SQL file we want to load. We have the preset. Then uh, we have the solid body. Uh, basically, the solid body is predefined by us, and you are and it's when it's get all the properties uh, from or from uh, the solid pre presets and uh, then based on that we decide okay what kind of job types we need to run so if it's a redshift transform then we will run a redshift transform and we do some other steps as well so in a solid body basically what we do it's uh, checking the inputs uh, doing the actual job execution so in this case like if it's a redshift transform they're running sql on redshift and then validating output if uh, if it was generated or not or if it's failed etc well one more thing what we do as well we we are doing some kind of templating so basically uh, uh, in the solid inputs you can define in your like in your sql you, you can say the, uh, the friendly name of the input and then we will replace the friendly name in your sql with the actual table names and now you have a nice solid for the, uh, the configs, the presets, and the body, but you have to define dependencies uh, between the solids and what kind of dependencies, the input and outputs there are. And here we as well uh, are using uh, the JSON descriptor. And as you can see there, we are generating a typed uh, input. So in this case, because it's a, a, a redshift table that's why we generate a redshift flowkeeper pass it's called uh, in this example and uh, and as well we are generating for the second input and also we generate the output and when we are generating the dependency 
basically what we do, uh, we do the same depends and dependency setup, what, we, what I mentioned earlier, basically based on the inputs and outputs, uh, output paths and, and table names, we look up which job generate that and we do the connection between the solids based on that. And here you go, here is a nice small pipeline defined. Uh, and last but not least, we also add some solid metadata, which not needed for the solid itself, but it's more like uh, like Dexter uh, uh, as an orchestrator, and also because we want to uh, add some nice tagging onto these solids. So just a few examples here. When we set the max retries, basically this this is what uh, what which says that how many times we want to retry a failing job before uh, failing actually and and stopping retrying and also we set the tier here and based on the, this tier we also set the dexter priority uh, for the orchestrator and also we set like the dexter salary queue based on the job type what i mentioned before for uh, resource based uh, scheduling or for the resource queues so now we have a nice solid. Uh, we could do this for one specific job, uh, but we wanted to make this uh, migration the less painful. So basically, uh, basically transparent to our users. So let's give you an example. Uh, and we wanted to see our, our daily pipeline as one huge pipeline. Uh, that was one, one of the requirements from the beginning, what we want to achieve. Uh, because what we saw, like other orchestrators, uh, that they they start to have problems if you have like hundreds of of uh, jobs or solids in in one pipeline, and that's why you have to basically strip uh, your pipeline into multiple pipeline and doing the connection between those pipelines. But the problem is that with usually most of these tools, that you can't really see the connection between the pipelines. And uh, that, that was one of the reasons why we really wanted to keep everything in, in, uh, at one place and not basically being uh, uh, taking apart. And another thing, of course, that uh, uh, in, in the current state, we, we are not really able to do this because we have now 900 jobs and it would take a significant amount of time to do this. So what we did, uh, we get all of the descriptors and load it into Dexter. And let me show you how this looks like. Uh, the whole pipeline loaded into Dexter. So as you can see, here's a huge graph. Uh, you can see it looks pretty nice, but it's not very useful in this way because you can't see much about that. Uh, uh, as you can see, so it's very small everything. Even if you zoom there, it's very hard to find anything. Uh, but luckily, down there, there is this nice selector where you can just select, uh, sub-select of the pipeline, which can be super useful, especially if you try to understand your uh, pipeline or if you want to change some job and you are interested what other jobs will be can be affected with the, uh, that change or, or even if you are doing some kind of debugging where you are interested in if this job failed, what others can be uh, affected. So I think it's a pretty cool thing. So now we have uh, all of the jobs and, uh, and we, we, we can load into Dexter uh, all of these, uh, and we can generate from our jobs solids and all of the solids can be loaded into Dexter. But another thing what we wanted to achieve, like the similar user experience, what we have currently, or even better, uh, but, uh, here as well. And here's the workflow, what we come up, how you, how you develop uh, uh, your ETL, a new ETL job. So basically the workflow is the following. You as a user, you start working uh, on your new shiny ETL job. You start a uh, local development environment. Local development environment is basically uh, doc, doc, uh, uh, Dexter running in Docker and locally. So, and there, you can start working on your job testing and even you can go uh, to access uh, services with your own credential. When you are happy with your jobs, with, with your job, you have to create a pull request in uh, GitHub. 
and then somebody reviews that and in the meantime as well Jenkins runs a check on this job what we do uh, what we are actually checking it's another I think pretty nice feature in Dexter that uh, you can introduce modes as well you, you can create multiple modes and we introduce this test mode where uh, which actually not touching any of the resources but what it does it just uh, runs the whole pipeline and basically checks if uh, there are circular de dependencies if there is any config issues uh, and and if we are able to run the whole pipeline uh, without running on actual resources which is cool if that's passed then you can deploy we are using uh, the kubernetes uh, executor with uh, a kubernetes salary executor so what's happened in this case so you have the your job basically this uh, in the end what you do it basically just committing an a json file into a repo based on that we we run we do a test run and if everything is fine then we create a docker image from all of these descriptors and and we and deploy it to dexter as a user code uh, separately uh, and then when you start or 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 a new pipeline run schedules then these, these uh, jobs goes into salary and and basically in in salary uh, in the salary queue uh, uh, in various uh, resource uh, resource queues like we defined uh, a separate queue for redshift for presto and hadoop and python in hadoop uh, that, that one where like spark and uh, uh, jobs are running and Basically, in this way, we can make sure that these queues, when when a job is executing from the Redshift queues, then we can make sure that only like five parallel jobs is running. And it can happen can happen that you are overwhelming uh, a Redshift cluster and no one else can be basically querying it, which is uh, not a good thing if it would happen. Uh, and another benefit running on Kubernetes, all of these jobs are running in a separate pod, which is nice because jobs can interfere with each other. If it's using to manage memory, CPU, whatever, the pod got killed, but the other jobs can run, which is cool. And also another cool thing in the salary executor that all this prioritization is there. So it's even treat or priority settings. Uh, yeah, it's even treat or, uh, priority settings and it's super nice but and we also got a, a few nice additional values using Dexter one is this nice data lineage uh, visualization that I showed you before the other one is this uh, pipeline performance monitoring which is pretty nice because uh, most of the time uh, if it turns out uh, you want to figure out if your pipeline is running uh, slower than expected and also then you want you are interested in why and which solid or job runs longer than uh, before because maybe there was some kind of change somebody committed a, a change there which caused this or or maybe there is some issue with your Hadoop cluster or whatever another thing is like a easier pipeline debugging uh, i think it's a pretty nice ui where you can basically see the logs immediately and you have this nice filter as well filtering down what you are uh, and here uh, the, uh, the solid selectors where you can only see that portion of the uh, pipeline what you are really interested in and oops, sorry And the testing capability, it's super nice, actually. That's what I showed you in, uh, in, the, in the GitHub example or the Jenkins example. So it's super cool. And, and we, we can make sure that we are letting way less garbage in with this uh, running the whole pipeline in a test run. And of course, this nice type and config checking, which comes automatically. So if you go to the playground, as you can see, if you uh, start specifying parameters based on the job type, it will uh, hint you 
what you can use and also you get some nice uh, type checking if for example this is, is external should be a boolean but uh, somebody started to type a string then it will fail immediately which is super nice so this is where we are and actually but we still we are still working so this migration is still in progress so basically we are now at 10 percentage so we migrated 10 percent of all, all of our jobs we are slowly migrating we are basically migrating a few jobs testing if, if, if it works fine and then going back and and trying to mig migrate more jobs uh, we need to do more extensive user testing and also onboarding all of our analysts and and in this way we can basically speed up uh, the migration because we can uh, create and actually that's what what we are currently working on some kind of migration guide which we can we, what we can hand over to them and they can do on their own uh, this type of uh, the, to migrate their own jobs improve backfield capabilities i was super happy seeing that there will be a bunch of improvements around that uh, we we really would like to see that uh, and and yeah this is something what we as well are working on to improve that and introduce better quality checks. So currently, as I told you, uh, quality checks is basically if there is a file or not, or the, if there is a table or not, or if there is at, at least one row in the table or not. But we can, uh, we would like to introduce more sophisticated uh, quality checks as well later on. And uh, last but not least, thank you, Dexter team. I think it's super nice, and I I'd be really happy with the co uh, cooperation and for all of these things what you implemented i think it's super nice and uh, we started to work on this almost a year ago and where it was dexter a year ago and where now it's incredible where, where you get there and i think you are like really in a ludicrous mode so releasing new features <laughs>